do you have a labral tear? Are you considering surgery to get it fixed? Or you might already have a date all scheduled for the surgery. Now, I understand that for patients, no matter how small the surgery, most patients are going to have a fair amount of anxiety. So in today's video, I hope to give you as much information as possible to try to allay your fears as best as possible. Now, please note that the information I give today is probably applicable to most patients, but there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, the other thing is this might be a pretty long and lengthy video. So if that is the case for you, feel free to use the timestamps to forward to the, time, the parts that uh, might be more relevant for you. So let's get on with the video. Now, first of all, what is a labral tear? Well, the shoulder is a ball and a socket joint. Now, there is a ring of cartilage that surrounds the rim of the shoulder. Now, this ring of cartilage is known as the labrum. So whenever the labrum is detached from the rim of the socket, now that is known as a labral tear. Now, depending on case to case, uh, patients might have varying symptoms. So some patients might have instability, meaning that the shoulder dislocates very easily in certain positions. Uh, other patients do not have any problems with instability at all. Other patients usually have pain, you know, and this, this pain is typically felt during sports and activities. So overhead sports is a prime example. So patients might find that they cannot serve as hard uh, if they play tennis or they might find that if they spike a volleyball, they get pain in the shoulder. So this surgery that you're about to undergo is a keyhole surgery, meaning it is a minimally invasive surgery. Now it is done under general anesthesia. We'll talk more about the general anesthesia in a short while. But what the surgeon does is that under general anesthesia, he makes a small little cut at the back of the shoulder. Through that, he can put a camera into the shoulder joint. Once the camera is in the shoulder joint, he has an extremely clear view of where exactly the tear is and he can tell the extent of the tear and the way the labrum is torn. Now with that, he can then make one or sometimes two other small cuts at the front of the shoulder and through that, he can put in his instruments to proceed with the repair. Now, how is the repair done? Well, the labrum is a cartilaginous material so it is easy to put stitches around the labrum. However, the bone is hard like a piece of wood, so it is not possible to stitch wood. Now, what he has to do is that using those stitches, he needs to anchor it back onto the bone and he does that using small little plastic anchors known as suture anchors. Now, you do not have to be worried about the suture anchors. They are non-metallic, so you don't have to be worried that they might set off the alarms at the airport, for example. They are also designed to be long term you know so they're not gonna go rusty they're not gonna become bad or, or rotten or anything like that you do not have to worry about removing them at all in fact a lot of the modern suture anchors are designed to be absorbable so after two to three years they actually dissolve and they become bone now in terms of scars because the wounds are pretty small the one at the back is typically something like five millimeters perhaps the one at the front is slightly bigger it's about one centimeter However, because they're quite small, the wounds heal very fast. Typically, within two weeks, they are healed, and the scar is usually not too visible at all. Now, the surgery is performed under general anesthesia. What that means is that the patient is completely asleep during the whole duration of the surgery. The process of general anesthesia is usually very simple. So, an anesthetist is the doctor who would be administering the anesthesia, and he will be staying with you throughout the whole duration of the surgery, and you will be monitored throughout the whole duration of the surgery as well, which makes general anesthesia extremely, extremely safe. Now, what happens is that the anesthetist will insert a small needle into the back of the hand usually, and through that, he will administer the anesthetic drugs. Now, once the anesthetic drugs go into the system, most patients will not even be able to stay awake for more than 10 seconds, perhaps. Now, uh, a lot of patients are actually worried. They, they, they actually ask me, oh, is there a possibility that I can wake up in the middle of the surgery? Well, let me reassure you that that does not happen. And the reason for that is that the, the, excuse me, the, anesthesia, the anesthetist will use uh, probes that are placed on the skin of the forehead and with those, they can monitor the brain waves. Now, they cannot read your thoughts, but they can monitor the brain waves. So they will know if the anesthesia is getting a bit lighter and they can then administer more of the drug to ensure that you will never wake up halfway through during the surgery. Now, once the surgery is done, all the anesthetist has to do is to turn off the flow of the anesthetic drug and you will be awake within 5 to 10 minutes. 
In terms of risk of the surgery, unfortunately, risk exists in all types of surgery that we do, no matter how small. And the labor repair, unfortunately, is no exemption to the rule. However, the risk of the labor repair are extremely, extremely low. Now, whenever we talk about risk, we talk about two groups of risks, right? The first group pertains to anesthesia. The second group pertains to the surgery itself. Let's talk about anesthesia first. Now, potentially serious things can and sometimes do occur in anesthesia, and that might include even serious, serious things like death even, right? Strokes, heart attacks, uh, transient difficulty, breathing, etc. They all can occur. However, the risk of that happening to you would be less than... 1%, way less than 1%. In fact, I oftentimes tell patients that it is probably safer to undergo anesthesia than it is for you to walk across the road later. Now, in terms of the surgery itself, again, many different risks can occur. So, so things like uh, infections, uh, accidental fractures, injury to nerves and blood vessels, um, what else? Uh, making the injury worse, perhaps, they all can happen. However, the risks of that are extremely remote. Now, by far, the biggest risk where the surgery is concerned is failure of the surgery to fully resolve your problem. So, for a patient with a dislocating shoulder, let's say, he might suffer recurrences of dislocations sometime in the future. However, that risk is also low. Now, worldwide reported figures of that happening might be something like 15% chance, but please note that those are patients with a huge disparity in terms of uh, the, the, the type of injury, the surgeon, the type of surgery done, the type of implants done, etc. So in local context, uh, the recurrence rate or the failure of the surgery to adequately resolve the situation, uh, we're probably talking about in the region of 3 to 5%. Next, we talk about pre-operative instructions. Are there any things you need to prepare before the surgery? Well, the answer to that is no, except you need to take note that six hours before the surgery, uh, you cannot have anything to eat or drink. This is more for the purposes of the anesthesia, actually. Uh, but up to two hours before the surgery, you can have a small amount of plain water. Please note that this only applies to plain water. So things like coffee, orange juice, milk, Milo, etc. Those are not allowed. A lot of patients also wonder, do I need to do any additional tests before the surgery? Blood tests, chest x-rays, etc. Well, most patients who have labor repair surgery done are young. So if you are under the age of about 50 years old, you do not need to have any investigations in terms of blood tests and all that done. Uh, unless you do have uh, quite a few medical conditions, for example, things like diabetes, heart problems, uh, blood pressure issues, which we don't often see in patients who are younger. Uh, so if you do have some of those conditions, uh, you might require... Uh, to have some pre-operative investigations done, otherwise usually not required. Okay, we've come to the last segment of this video. I'm going to walk you through the entire surgery day, right? So first of all, six hours before the surgery, please do not have anything to eat or drink. But like I mentioned earlier, you can have just a little bit of plain water up to two hours before the surgery. Now, about two hours before the surgery, uh, you will need to present yourself to the hospital for registration. For most hospitals, there's going to be a registration counter for patients. So that's where you go to. You would have been given a, a small stack of documents for, for admissions purposes. So you just need to pass this to the receptionist and she will do whatever needs to be done. So just chill out for a little while. And after a while, she will usher you back up. Uh, not back up, sorry. You know, she will usher you to your hospital room where you will then rest uh, for a while. About 45 minutes before the designated surgery time, an attendant will come to bring you down to the operating theater where the anesthetist will meet you at the operating theater reception. So over there, the anesthetist will get to know you, get to know if you have got any medical problems, perhaps uh, run you through how the anesthesia is going to go. Um, and of course, answer any questions that you might have. So if everything is A-OK, -okay, you will be brought into the operating theater. Over there, the anesthetist will put a tiny needle in the arm or in the hand and he will then administer the, the, the anesthetic drug once you're ready. Uh, once that is done, he will then put an oxygen mask on you, put the neuromonitoring uh, probes on your head 
and then the surgery can then proceed. Now once the surgery is done, the anesthetist will then turn off the anesthetic drug and within about 5-10 to 10 minutes you should be awake. Uh, please note that you still will be very drowsy and you will be quite uh, forgetful for the duration of time that the anesthetic drug remains in your system. So that might be for about 1.5 to 2 hours depending on the patient. Uh, after the surgery is done, they will monitor you in the recovery room for something like 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and if everything is A-OK, -okay, then you'll be sent up to your uh, ward room where you can rest. So for patients who are doing the surgery as a day surgery procedure, uh, once you're nice and awake, let's say in about three to four hours, uh, the nurse will then come and have a check with you before uh, they send you home. For patients who are staying overnight, well, please feel free to sleep and I will drop by to have a chat with you the next morning. Right, I hope this video has been useful for you and I hope that at least some of your fears might be slightly reduced. I wish you all the best for your surgery and I'm confident that you will get back into action real soon.